<clears throat> the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the cults. And you'll see on the front of your folder various symbols representing other religions, other philosophies, other cults. Not all of them, of course, um, but some of them. And I thought that I'd begin with Islam because it is the, the fastest growing of these other religions. It is so much in the news and there is so much that is um, not understood or not known about it. But I want to start with an anchor, a frame of reference in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 13 and 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. God is uh, dealing with false teaching at Corinth. And so he speaks through the Holy Spirit through Paul. And he's talking about people who are teaching things contrary to the truth. And he says, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. Disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder they do this, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Part of the kingdom of Satan, part of the kingdom of darkness, part of that is very dark. It doesn't take much an imagination to understand how different some religions are from Christianity. The darkness is very apparent. Some are blatantly so, such as the Church of Satan. There's no question there about its being different from the Church of Christ. <clears throat> But much of the confusion comes with religions or cults that share a great deal with true Christianity. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light in those circumstances. He appears to be the truth, but it's only a half-truth and it's a lie, it's a deception. So Paul is dealing with that at the church of Corinth. And he says to another church, to the church at Thessalonica, in his epistle, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12, he says, And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. He is explaining to the Thessalonians, one of the dynamics of entering into a belief system, a life system, into a life in which you reject Christ and you accept something in his place. And he's explaining that these people did not receive the love of the truth. They rejected the love of the truth. And so he goes on, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a, and the King James Version here has a very good translation. It says a strong delusion. You may have um, a deceptive working or, or an energy of delusion or something to that nature. But it actually has the connotation in the Greek of, of a, a supernatural Delusion having to do with with things either of God or of Satan. A strong delusion to believe what is false, that they should be separated out for condemnation, who believe not the truth, but delighted in unrighteousness, delighted in wickedness, delighted in unrighteousness. When you put these two passages together in 2 Corinthians and in 2 Thessalonians, Paul is reiterating the point that Jesus made in the third chapter of the Gospel of John. In the third chapter of John, he begins a discussion, as you remember, with Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee who wanted to know more about Jesus. And he came to him at night, whether because he wanted a private audience 
or he didn't want it well known in the Sanhedrin that he was seeking Jesus out for some answers. Whatever his reason, he came to Jesus and he said, I know, we know, probably speaking for himself and Joseph of Arimathea and several other Pharisees that were um, inclined to accept him as Messiah. We know that you are come from God for no man can do these things except God be with him. And he, he enters into a conversation theologically about what, what is the real truth. And Jesus immediately deals with his specific need. You see, Nicodemus was a man who was well educated in the scriptures. He would be today what you might consider a Bible scholar. Somebody who writes commentaries. And he was a believer. He was, he was an evangelical or a conservative or in the early church, you would call him, you know, a, a doctor of the church, something of that nature. And so Jesus went right to where his specific need was, which is you must be born again or you can't even see the kingdom of God. You must be born again or you can't even see the kingdom of God. Jesus goes on in that chapter to tell Nicodemus. It starts with God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. But this is the condemnation that has come into the world. And Jesus goes on to explain that those who do not open their hearts when confronted with this are not in fact just misinformed. It's not that they don't have quite enough data. It's not that, you know, the right song wasn't sung for them or the right context wasn't created for them. Jesus goes on to say that people who do not open their hearts to him do not do so because they hate the light and they refuse to come to it. They reject the light. That's what Paul is doing when he's writing to the Corinthians and to the Thessalonians. He's saying you have to understand that in this free will context of the world, there are those who not only freely choose to reject the truth, but they gladly accept something else and they delight in that unrighteousness. It's an open rejection and an embracing of something else. So I want to bring that forward as we begin on the discussion of Islam and Christianity. Islam versus Christianity. <clears throat> A little bit of background is that Muhammad was born in about 570 A.D., that's 570 years after the birth of Christ. And when he was about 40 years old is when he began to receive these um, visible visions from Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, he said. He would go to this cave and pray and then Gabriel would physically appear to him, according to Muhammad. I have to understand that Muhammad's personal journey of faith during his first 40 years was that he had uh, spent some time with uh, Jews and uh, understood their teaching, understood the Bible stories, understood who Adam was, who Abraham was, who Moses was, the giving of the law, the various prophets. And he also spent some time with Christians and had the, the, the gospel and he knew who Jesus was and and Mary and so forth and so on. And after all of that, he went into um, a period of isolation and that's where he meets, according to him, Gabriel the angel and he begins to give him the um, revelations of the uh, Quran. Here's a uh, a translation of the Quran. It's about 700 pages. And it's, it's most close, I guess, to uh, the Psalms. A bunch of statements 
um, a bunch of revelations in, in Psalms is really the, the way it comes across. It's not written as a, as a history like you'd see in Genesis, Exodus, uh, the Torah. It's not written like uh, the book of Samuel or Kings. It's more like the Psalms and, and the book of Proverbs. So at any rate, he began taking dictation for about uh, uh, three years from this. Now, he was illiterate. He couldn't read or write. And uh, so he had um, some scribes with him that would actually uh, write down uh, what was important. And what's interesting is that he married his first wife, Khadija. And um, after he was receiving these revelations, towards the end of that period, he had some doubts as to whether this was really from God and the angel Gabriel or whether it was from another source. And Khadija helped explain to him the good that he was doing and what it was doing to the community. And so he, he, uh, he forsook that period of doubt and, and implemented uh, rule by the, uh, by the Koran. Now, just to give you an idea, as we go to the slide on the religions of the world, <clears throat> Christianity makes up about one third of the world, about one third of the world, and closest to it is Islam, which would be about uh, 22% uh, and growing. It's expected from uh, the prognostications that Islam will overtake within 100 years, 50 to 100 years, will overtake Christians in the world. Uh, within, within this um, century. And you can see that um, the third most in uh, a different religion are the, the Hindus and then various others from that. You have, you have folk faith in, in China as, as well as India, Japan, and other places. And uh, we'll talk about some of those at, at the appropriate time. But I wanted to concentrate on, on Islam. I want to give you an idea of the two major groups of Islam. By far and away, the largest group are the Sunnis. The Sunnis, S-U-N-N-I. They are 85 to 90% of all Muslims in the world. 85 to 90%. And their difference from the Shiites, who are primarily in Iran, 90 plus percent of Iranians are Shiite Muslims and also in Iraq. But the main difference is who they accept as their authority. The Sunnis went with the caliphs or the rulers after Muhammad and the Shiites went with blood relationships from Muhammad. <clears throat> there are 20 to 25 other denominations of Islam that I don't think it would be fruitful to go into. But in those various denominations of Islam, you have the Wahhabi, which are very zealous and pro-terrorists in their teaching. You have the Brotherhood. You have Hamas. You have Hezbollah. So in those other splinter groups from Sunni or from Shiite, you have these other more radical groups. And as I said, there are about 20 or 25. But the main thing I want to get at is what 90% of the Muslims believe. I would characterize Islam as a religion which tries to appear more like the light rather than more like the darkness. Why do I say that? <clears throat> that is because their teaching in the Quran has passages like what I'm about uh, to read to you. The Quran, if you read it from cover to cover and know it inside out, you will have about 10% of what the beliefs are of Islam. 
There is another book or series of books called the Hadith, which are the conversations, the commentaries of Muhammad and his descendants. And that's where the bulk of their theology and their belief system arises. But within the Quran itself, the part that comes across trying to be more like light and truth are passages like these. It is not piety that you turn your faces to the east and to the west. What he's saying is that if you're a Muslim, if you're Islamic, wherever you are in the world, you turn towards Mecca when you pray five times a day. And he's saying these things do not make piety. True piety is this, to believe in God and the last day, the angels, the book, and the prophets, to give of one substance, however cherished, however much you may care for what you have, to give it to kinsmen, to orphans, to the needy, to travelers, to beggars, to ransom and make free the slaves, to pray, to be willing to give alms and to fulfill the covenant to go through hardship, peril, and be true to your faith. This is truly what piety and God-fearing is. In the Quran, it goes on to teach that Gabriel appeared to Mary and said that uh, Mary, even as a virgin, you were going to give birth to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so in the Quran, it teaches that Mary was a virgin, that she gave birth to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. It also teaches that Jesus was absolutely sinless. It also teaches that he is going to come back and defeat the evil ruler of the whole world and set up his kingdom and reign. So you see where I say that there are parts in the Quran and in Islam that could appear very much like light. It teaches quite clearly that God elected the nation of the Jews during Old Testament times. They were a special people. He did not elect other peoples. He elected the children, plural, of Abraham. So you have on the one hand, you have the line through Isaac and Jacob. And you have the other hand, you have the line through Ishmael. Both elect by God. Both elect. And for the Jews, he gave them the Old Testament, which is the word of God. So the Koran teaches that the Old Testament is the word of God. And Allah says that he is the God of the Old Testament. And that he gave them prophets like Moses, as well as the law. So that they could live out their life in covenant and love. And that they rejected it and disobeyed and went into idolatry. And so he has punished them. And then in the Quran, it goes on to say that. So what he did do is he sent them the Messiah. The son of Mary, the virgin. And that he not only did that, but he gave the Messiah apostles to preach the gospel to the world. Do you see where this appears to have light? Are you getting the message? So what else does it say? Here's what else it says. It says that Jesus was not crucified for you and me or for any man. It completely rejects the concept of a substitutionary atonement. Now, if you know your Koran real well, you'll say, now, wait a minute, Rick. It talks about how Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. And that God spared him with a great sacrifice. Yes, he spared him. He spared Isaac with the ram that was caught in the bushes. And it was a great sacrifice because it was a miracle. 
It has the concept of substitutionary atonement in the sense of somebody can be substituted for something else in a specific incident. <clears throat> it does not have the Christian or Jewish concept of without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And that in Jesus, he bore in his body, in his body, he bore all of our sins. That is rejected. And so it reads in the Quran. This is what they say about the actual crucifixion of Christ. And then I'll talk about what they say about it in the Hadith. We slew the Messiah. These are the Jews speaking. You're saying that we slew the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of God. <clears throat> Yet they did not slay him. Neither did they crucify him. Only a likeness of him was shown to them. <clears throat> what Allah did was raise him up to heaven. The teaching of the Quran is that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He was the Messiah. And we'll see when we get into their beliefs in eschatology that he's coming back. So he didn't die on the cross. In fact, the cross is an abomination to Allah. The cross is an abomination to Allah. What Allah did was he took Jesus like Enoch into heaven. He took Jesus like Enoch into heaven. And he had a substitute from one of the disciples die on the cross for him. Some of their commentators say that that substitute was Judas, the traitor. Who actually was crucified on the cross. Because you see, that substitutionary atonement concept is considered a complete abomination. In their teaching. They also teach that Jesus, while he was sinless. While he was born of a virgin. And while he was the Messiah. He was not God. The Koran also teaches that anybody who believes that God is in three persons is condemned. That God is one. That God is one. He can't be in three persons. In their eschatology, they have something very, very interesting. Now, see how much of this sounds like Christian teaching. What's going to happen in the world is a very powerful ruler called the Masi Ad Dajjal. That is the Messiah of deception. He's going to deceive the whole world and bring it into chaos. They have like 10 major signs of the coming of the end of the world and 50 minor signs. I won't go into all of those. <clears throat> but minor signs are like disrespect for parents and uh, listening to too much music, things like that. Major signs are more along the lines of what uh, you hear from Jesus in Matthew 24, earthquakes, major earthquakes and, and stuff of that nature. Now, what's interesting is this Masi Ad Dajel the Messiah of deception in Arabic. He overwhelms the world with deception and power. And Allah raises up the Mahdi. Now the Mahdi is the 12th Ayman or Iman. He was a young child, the 12th Ayman, at about five years old, and he disappeared. Nobody knew where he went. They said that Allah took him to heaven. He's going to bring him back. This Mahdi is able to bring peace around Medina and some of the holy places of Islam. 
through his special efforts while the Messiah of deception is running the world, this Mahdi, this last prophet of Islam, is able to bring peace in the Middle East for seven years. For seven years. And then the Messiah of deception <clears throat> attacks and goes in to Medina and destroys its Kaaba, its Holy of Holies, which is a cube, which is a cube, just like the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle or the Temple of Solomon. He goes in and destroys it. And the Mahdi cannot overwhelm him. The heavens split open at the end of the seven years. The heavens split open and out of the heavens comes Jesus Christ on a white horse. And he comes down and he joins the Mahdi and he defeats the Messiah of deception and brings peace and a golden age to the world. He reigns for 40 years. During the first 19 years, Jesus gets married and has children. In his 40th years, he, he dies and he's buried next to Muhammad. And the Mahdi continues <clears throat> in this golden age. And then what happens is a series of things, not in chronological order, but there's Gog and Magog and there's some chaos and judgment. And Allah is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And Muhammad. Muhammad is going to be the advocate, the intercessor for all true Muslims. And there's a last judgment and a resurrection. For all eternity, Muhammad is going to sit next to Allah on his right hand for all eternity. The first heaven below Allah is going to be occupied by Adam. The heaven below that is going to be occupied by John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. And, and it goes down through the, the, the major Old Testament prophets. So that you see a real appreciation of the, of the Old Testament. By the way, wherever the Quran or the Hadith disagree in a verse or in a telling of a story, you're to take... Muhammad's later revelation is true because it means that Allah not only changed the verse, but he changed history. <clears throat> How much of a counterfeit do you think that is for those of you who understand your Christian eschatology? In which God is going to restore Israel. He's going to restore Israel. Romans 11, some of the greatest reform Calvinistic commentators like John Calvin, like Murray, like Hendrickson, talk about Romans 11 and God restoring Israel. All the early church believed that the first 350 years, that's what they taught. In the Catholic church, that's what Cardinal Bellarmine taught in the 1700s. He says, look at what the early church believed. <clears throat> they had a healthy respect. Moses is actually ahead of uh, Abraham uh, on the heavens. What's interesting also is that the first person, everybody at the resurrection, everybody is raised naked. Better lose weight. <laughs> Everybody is raised naked. The first one raised is Muhammad. The second one raised is Abraham. Abraham because the, becomes the first one clothed by Allah. And then Muhammad. <laughs> it's interesting. It's just full of little surprises. Full of little surprises. What I was saying is that 
in, your, in the eschatology of the, of the early church, and, and this, is the, this is the eschatology that Muhammad would have heard. You understand what I'm saying? He was born in 570. This is what was being taught. Was that the Messiah was going to come back. The heavens were going to split open. He was going to come back on a white horse. He was going to defeat the Antichrist, the beast in the book of Revelation. There was going to be a golden age. And after that, a new heaven and a new earth. All of that is in their eschatology. Point for point, word for word. Except the personages have been exchanged to some extent. And the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ has been ripped from it. Think, if you were Satan, instead of that perceived Gabriel giving this revelation to Muhammad, what is the one thing you wouldn't teach? So before I get into talking about how to witness to people of Islam, <clears throat> I want to just talk about a couple of examples. Al-Gharib was converted, a Muslim that was converted, and he was converted primarily through scripture. He had some bad experiences, some financial failures in his home country in, in the Middle East. And he came to America. He came to America and he actually joined an evangelical church and he confessed Christ and he was baptized. And he says that as he was coming up out of the water, he was saying in his mind, there is no God but Allah. I believe in him and the, the one prophet, Muhammad. But he said what happened as, as he continued to fellowship with these people who helped him get a job and helped him get on his feet and cared for him was that he was going to Bible study with them. And he said the scriptures slowly began to penetrate, really began to penetrate. And he finally accepted Christ and he asked that pastor if he could be baptized. And the pastor didn't want to baptize him twice. So... He said, you don't understand, I, I wasn't even a believer when you did that. I knowingly was confessing Allah and Muhammad. And I've come to see that Jesus Christ paid for my sins. And I've come to see that through the power of the real word of God. Nabil Qureshi went from Islam to Christianity and he had these four observations in an interview that I want to share. Number one, he said, <clears throat> they were asking him, uh, the, the first question was, what misconceptions do Americans and people of the West, and especially even we evangelicals, what misconceptions do we have about Muslims? Now, here's a... Here's a confessing born-again Muslim. And he says, first of all, the majority, the grand majority of us are really peaceful. We're not part of these splinter groups like the Brotherhood and Hamas and Hezbollah and Wahhabi and so forth. That, that is, that we consider radical. Number two, all Muslims are not the same. There's like 20 to 30 different denominations of Muslims that have specific beliefs about different things. <clears throat> Number three, many of the Muslims are devout, not just in their prayer cycle and in Ramadan and, and the other things that they observe and in reading the Quran and going to the mosque, but, but really devout in giving to charities, helping the poor, helping just, you don't have to be Islamic, you just need to be poor and they'll help you. Many, many are like that. And they said, well, what do you think is the key difference then between Islam and the, the, first, the faith that you've converted to? And he says, well, for me, the key difference is that the Quran is a book of lies and the Bible is the word of God. I came to see that. 
Number two, Allah is not the God of the Old Testament. He said, one of the things I struggled with was that they, they told me that when I would read the Old Testament, whenever you see the word God, it, it's really Allah who's there. And he said, the Allah of the Koran is not the God of the Old Testament, and he's not the God of the New Testament. The other thing is that Jesus was man and God, and he did pay for my sins. There's none of that. There's none of that here. There's none of that here. There is a girl, a lady now, Anahita Parzan. And she escaped uh, persecution in the various warring uh, factions of Islam. And she made her way to Sweden and she went to a Bible college. And she is an active preacher of the Christian faith. Born again. And she says that the most powerful way to deal with a Muslim is to start with Jesus Christ tasted death for every person. He loved you. God loved you so much that he died for you individually because that concept is just not there. You have to stress in your own life. The individual love for the individual and the, stub the substitutionary atonement for the individual. Because that's all lacking. Now, now let me <clears throat> tell you in closing here. In Islam, in its eschatology, even after the judgment, you have to walk across a bridge and hell is below you and if Allah shakes that bridge you fall off into hell so even if you're one of his prophets even if you're the Ayatollah Khomeini even if you're Abraham when you walk across that bridge if he changes his mind, no matter how you've lived, you'll fall into hell. Now, you won't be there forever because Muhammad is going to intercede for you. And all the true Muslims are going to be even brought out of hell. <clears throat> Another thing is their eschatology is in the final analysis. Guess who makes up almost everybody in hell? Christians and Jews and women. Christians and Jews and women. I, I, I don't know how to make this light or humorous well, from my illustrations. Betty had uh, a good friend by the name of Farah who had been Muslim. And her personal testimony was one in which she saw Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of God. <clears throat> and after that, she believed. In fact, this is so common among Islamic people who are deep, deep, deep into these Islamic cultures that you couldn't get a New Testament to them if FedEx tried to deliver it. It is so common to hear testimonies of dreams and visions of Jesus Christ that bring these people to conversion that you can go online and you have evangelical Christians raising all kinds of questions. Are these legitimate? Are these legitimate? You know, do they have another agenda? And I can understand that. But Billy Graham told, well, he wrote a book called Angels. I'll close with this. And he said, it's amazing. Out when, when, um, when Ruth, Ruth Graham, her name was Ruth Bell and, and her, uh, her mom and dad were medical missionaries in China. So that, you know, uh, Ruth Graham is dead, has been dead a couple of years. And so that, you know, we're going back a long way into the early 1900s, you know, before um, Mao Zedong Tung took over and all that. And out in the countryside, you know, there weren't Bibles. People, people were illiterate. You know, you can point to a Bible and say, here's, here's what it says. But they couldn't read it. There were no posters of Jesus Christ. 
You didn't have, you know, the 700 Club. You didn't have things that we take for, for granted. And Billy Graham said that there were stories of people who a tiger from the, from, the, from the jungle was coming up on them and they saw an angel appear and stand and the tiger just went away. And these people came to Christ. He said, you cannot believe the amount of spiritual things that happen in these God forsaken places where the word of God and preachers aren't. So part of the explanation as to why so many of these Muslims that become Christians do have these vivid dreams and do in fact see visions of Christ is because it is so difficult to get the word to them. But for those who have access to the word, born again Muslims say that the most effective way is to talk about the individual salvation passages and love of God for them through the word.